Okay, thanks for having me here. It's a, <coughs> a great pleasure to speak <coughs> in front of so many uh, Spark enthusiasts. Uh, so the title of my talk is Spark, the Ultimate Scala Collections, and I realize that's maybe a little bit provocative. Uh, for those of you who don't know Scala, uh, let me just slot it in. It's a functional language, also object-oriented. It's statically typed, and it's designed to interoperate very well with uh, Java and uh, recently also JavaScript. Uh, but that's kind of boring. It's just a categorization. Uh, the more important part is what were the, the main design principles, so the invariants that went through all of Scala's design and that made Scala the language it is. And I think there are two. Uh, the first is really this idea of a scalable language. So Scala has flexible syntax, flexible types, user-definable operators, higher order functions, implicits. It's a whole bundle of tools to really make it very easy to build domain-specific languages on top of Scala, embedded into a Scala runtime. And that design principle has been spectacularly successful because there have been a large number of domain-specific languages that were sprouting up uh, with Scala as essentially the, the seed. So uh, two of them came out of Berkeley. Uh, that's uh, Chisel for hardware design and Spark, which, of course, you all know. Uh, a series of them came out of Stanford. That was the OptiX series of languages for staging. And then you can also think of, for instance, SBT, the Scala build tool as a domain-specific language, uh, Spiral, uh, essentially for program generation of very, very fast uh, algorithms, is, a, is another domain-specific language running on top of Scala, and so on. So uh, there's a whole lot of them, but uh, of course today we're going to talk about Spark, which is in a sense the most widespread, the most successful of all the DSLs that you see here. <coughs> so Spark is clearly a domain-specific language. It's a language for data analysis and big data. Uh, it's implemented in, in Scala, and it's embedded in Scala as a host language. So what you see here is the uh, Spark runtime runs on top of the JVM. And in between the JVM and the Spark runtime is the Scala runtime, essentially st the standard library, uh, the runtime modules. And then, of course, uh, it connects to uh, file systems, cluster managers, and so on. Uh, but the embedding is really deeper than that because there's also a layer on top of the Spark runtime. There's the repo. That's everybody who uses Spark uh, from Scala uses uh, the repo to essentially write the queries. And that repo is just the Scala repo. And the repo, in turn, to, make, uh, to do its work is, uh, needs the services of the Scala compiler. So when you write a Spark query in Scala, then actually all these components, they work together uh, to give you the result. So for the two reasons for domain-specific languages that we can see, uh, uh, quite a few of them are there because they want to essentially support new syntax, uh, add another language uh, to, and essentially Scala is a cheap way to implement that new syntax. And the second one is to support new functionality. Uh, and I find the second one much more interesting than the first because essentially that's where uh, you go deeper. You're not, you're not staying just at the surface. So Spark is clearly an uh, example of the second kind. So it actually is very conservative with the syntax, and I think that's one of its strengths, that it can just reuse a lot of things that we know from Scala, but it adds really powerful functionality. So uh, the functionality is centered around collections, and uh, the view of collections in both Scala and Spark is that they are immutable data sets equipped with functional transformations. And here you see some of them, which you, of course, all know uh, from the Spark side. But if you're a Scala programmer and know nothing of, uh, about Spark, then you know them also because these are exactly the Scala collection operations. And that, I think, was a, was a very big uh, a uh, very, very nice uh, confluence of, of, of ideas and uh, very nice reuse of essentially brain power. So is Spark then exactly Scala collections but running in a cluster? Actually, no. Uh, there are two differences, and I think the differences are important. The first is that Spark is lazy in its way it treats collections, and Scala collections are strict. And the second one is that Spark has some added functionality, in particular when it comes to pairs, the concept of pair RDDs. So if I take a step back and say, well, what kind of collections are out there, collection libraries, 
then I think the first uh, distinction is between the imperative collections that you know, for instance, from Java Util and the functional collections. Imperative, of course, is much more common. Almost every library has one uh, because uh, imperative programming has been mainstream for much, much longer than functional programming. But functional programming is catching up. So uh, once you go functional, then you have another distinction, and that, that's the question whether you're lazy or strict. So uh, there are strict functional collections. Uh, uh, for instance, the default collections in Scala are that, or OCaml is another language which would give you strict collections. Uh, lazy collections you find, uh, interestingly, in C Sharp. Uh, Link is uh, fundamentally lazy, also Spark. And there are some specific Scala collections that are lazy. So what's the difference? Um, the difference is best seen in a small example like this one. Let's say you have a, a function data.mapf, and uh, you put that in a value xs, and then you filter on the result, and then you take the sum, and uh, then you have another operation on xs where you just take the first elements and print them. So in a strict collection library, the map would be evaluated once, and the result of the map would be stored in the value xs. In a lazy collection library, all the map does, in a sense, it gives you a recipe how to compute the result. It doesn't actually compute the result. So XS would contain that recipe, and then map would be evaluated twice, once when you follow it up with the filter operation and once when you follow it up with the take. Laziness gets very confusing when mixed with side effects. Uh, so there's a paper by uh, Eric Meyer that argues this point very strongly. Uh, so Typically, to be predominantly lazy, you want a purely functional architecture. You want really to have basically no side effects in your program. But that's the use case of Spark. There are no side effects typically. It is a purely functional architecture. So laziness makes a lot of sense. The other reason where strictness makes sense is if I only look at the first line, I just want to do a simple map then really I want the result. I don't want to be concerned that, no, this is a recipe for the result and I have to force it or things like that. So the, that simple use case is strict is actually better. Now, in Spark, you probably wouldn't have a simple map. You have always more involved queries, and therefore the laziness makes a lot of sense because then you can optimize much better. But for a Scala program, that's actually the most common use case because, I mean, programs are often relatively trivial. You just want to do a simple thing and then do the next step. So that's also why I think do optimize a simple step case strict uh, in the programming language is actually uh, a good choice. But on the other hand, I think laziness is really very, very important for the more involved use cases. So what we uh, are about to do currently, we're sort of in the evaluate proposal stage, is to redo the concept of views for Scala collections. So here's how I would get the lazy behavior of Spark in uh, the next version of Scala Collections, hopefully, I would write xs, and then I would write dot view, and that turns it into a lazy collection. So now I have recipes. Now I can do a map and a filter. And I won't create intermediate results. I will just add to the recipe. And then at the end, I write force. Or uh, I can actually convert to a collection that of my choice when I, when I want to change the collection with a dot two. And another thing that I think we will uh, uh, gladly copy from, from Scala, uh, from uh, Spark, was this idea to use cache to essentially persist a view. That I think once you have views, that's a very, very good operation, and so far it was missing in Scala. So add cache to it and therefore get views somewhat on a par with what people can do in Spark. <coughs> The other thing that I, makes a lot of sense and with, that we will, will happily copy over to Scala is the pairwise operations that we see in the Scala collection libraries, things like reduce by key, group by key, lookups, and these would work on sequences of pairs analogously to pair RDVs. Um, that, of course, is nice because it provides a very lightweight way to add map-like operations to sequences. You can write uh, equivalent operations in Scala today, but they are clunkier. You have to introduce a map and then do the operations. And sometimes it's several steps where this, uh, with the, in, the, in the Spark library, a single method uh, is, is suffices. Good. So that was the first design principle, scalability, how it relates to collections. The second one is, in the second design principle of Scala, it's really that it's all about the types. Uh, 
types are first and foremost in the language design. They're the hardest part. Uh, they're the part that most of the, of the deliberation went into. Um, and when we talk about types, then uh, we often see a trade-off in the industry and in research. And the trade-off is between safety and flexibility. So uh, if you want to have maximal flexibility, then uh, you can make do with, with just a single type, or that also co is called an untyped language or a dynamically typed language, then you're maximally flexible. The types will never get in the way, but you're also, <coughs> essentially, you threw out all the possible safety guarantees that a type system can give you. On the other side, on the vertical axis, if you want to be maximally safe, then you write your program in an uh, essentially theorem prover like COC uh, or ACTA. And that way, you can actually prove the correctness of your program in the type. Uh, but of course, it uh, will take you sometimes a long time and a long ramp up to be able to do that. So it's always a trade-off between the two. And the goals of programming language designs uh, or the trend in type systems has recently been more towards safety. So we see essentially Scala is maybe some part of that, but more importantly, you see that in languages like Haskell and Idris and, uh, and Acta, where essentially you push the boundary of safety, which I find re really fascinating. It's a great development, um, sometimes even at the expense of ease of use. You say, well, <coughs> this might be good in some cases, but in most cases, really, it's not a good idea, so we will take it away. Um, Scala has been so far uh, on a different trajectory where we say, well, what we really want to get is a good amount of safety, sort of the state of the art in safety, maybe not the cutting edge yet, uh, at the flexibility that you could get from a dynamic language. So we wanted to push it sideways to say we want essentially to get that safety and not give up any of the, of the, a lot of the restrictions from a dynamic language. That's why some of parts of Scala actually feel rather dynamic. For instance, the actors are even untyped. Well, they have type any in the messages and then you get the types with pattern matching. These are sort of things that, for better or worse, are very, very dynamic, very, very flexible. They're maybe not super safe, it's a trade-off. But Scala was deliberately pu pushing into that direction. OK, where we'd like to move it in the future, of course, is all uh, in uh, uh, encompassing to, to say we want to be uh, not give up any of the flexibility, but uh, get a lot of uh, more safety in the future, for instance, by tracking effects and things like that. So, But that's sort of ongoing work and work that hasn't really hatched yet. So Spark, of course, is a multi-language platform. Scala is not the only citizen on Spark. There's Python, which is very popular. There's Java, there's R, there's SQL native. So uh, one should, of course, ask oneself, well, why Scala and not one of these other languages? Or so what are the advantages of Scala over, let's say, Python? So one thing I, I believe is, well, it's native to Spark. Spark is written in Scala. So if you want to go as far as, far as maybe add a module to Spark or understand what goes on in the source, and Scala is uh, an advantage. But the second and more important one, I think, for, at least from my perspective, you might disagree, is the types help a lot. Because if you, once you have these collection operations, the types give you this, uh, these guardrails where you say, well, it's almost impossible to make a mistake uh, that is not caught by the type checker. And I'm maybe uh, too squeamish. I would be very nervous to try to do these things without the help of a type checker to catch me out, to catch my errors. Because the types help a lot um, because it's functional. Uh, the, the, this combination of static typing and functional collections is really very powerful. Why? Because the functional operations, they don't have any hidden dependencies. That's the definition of a function. It takes inputs to outputs. There's no side effects. There's no hidden channel. Now, if you type check both the inputs and the outputs, as you do in a statically li li typed language, you have a very, very dense safety net. So every interaction is given a type. And that means that logic errors usually translate into type errors. Those of you who have used that, I guess you can uh, uh, you can um, under, you, you, you agree with me that you can write hundreds of lines of code and not have a single error once it passed the type checker. Uh, and that's an experience I never had before because I, I wasn't really that, that pedantic as a programmer. I always had these mistakes, and then I had to go into the debugger, and it was hell. Uh, but uh, nowadays, uh, I just run it through the type checker, and life is good. 
So it's a great asset for programming, and I think the same should hold for data science. Uh, I know that data scientists are sort of used to more languages like R and Python. That's where they come from. So, but I believe not, even if you do data science, then types should be a great asset too. So what we've seen so far is essentially what Spark and Scala are. Uh, how can Scala help Spark in the future? So I think there are several things uh, that we can uh, work on and will work on. One is the developer experience, uh, the infrastructure, the spores, and the fusion. Let me quickly talk uh, about some of these points. Um, about the infrastructure. So let me put up the design again, uh, how Spark is sort of embedded in the Scala system. What should we, TypeSafe and the Scala community, work on to actually help uh, Spark? So one thing we have worked on is uh, the Scala REPL, uh, where uh, we had a problem before mostly having to do with versions of JLine. Uh, JLine is this thing that every REPL uses because it does these, essentially these basic line editing commands. And unfortunately, there are many different versions, and they're incompatible. And Spark used one, and the Scala REPL used another. And that's why uh, the uh, Scala REPL had to be forked for Spark to actually use a different uh, JLine. So what we did was make JLine more pluggable, more auto-detectable. So that's a thing of the past. So now we can actually use the standard Scala REPL again. And the big advantage is of that is that then Spark also profits from some very nice developments that have recently been done on the Scala REPL, namely that the Scala REPL is now much more tightly integrated with the Scala compiler to give you things like auto-completion that are on a par with things like in the IDE. Before it was clunky, and now uh, you get the same level of auto completion that you would see in uh, IntelliJ or in the Eclipse IDE and things like that, because it goes out to the Scala compiler for the services. So that's essentially the advantage of not forking. You profit from each other's developments, uh, from each other's improvements. Um, Scala compiler, uh, it's the auto completion, but also, of course, the uh, uh, thing to uh, when we want to move to Java 8. Uh, we are compatible with Java 8, but in the next version, we want to profit from the advantages that Java 8 brings us. And those advantages are, uh, first, the use of lambdas. So no more inner classes. Lambdas are more compact and faster. And second, the use of default methods. Uh, default methods means that you don't need to write forwarders for traits anymore in Scala. Uh, and that together, they mean that your Scala jars and class files should become much, much more compact. So that's a way we can actually make use of Java 8 to get to shrink the size of Scala executables and also to make them uh, a little bit faster. Uh, the third area is the Scala runtime, where uh, we uh, want work, we are working on serialization and also integration with Java 8 streams. So the second aspect has to do with serialization also is uh, spores. So one problem that Spark experienced uh, several times, or at least we heard about it uh, repeatedly, is uh, the problem of uh, how to send closures over a network. So closures are essentially function values that also have to come with everything they reference. Uh, and they use Java serialization. And Java serialization is kind of unpredictable. Uh, so it, uh, it can lead to very, very large dependency graphs. So an example you see here, you have this class. And uh, it contains a data field of some very large collection. And then you take, make uh, a function, uh, value sum, which is data.sum. And then at some later point, you uh, want to print just the sum, not the data. And what you do is you pass the uh, closure, the function, uh, from x to print on sum to this uh, method do later. So that closure gets. Uh, 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 built, and if do later runs on a different computer, serialized over the, net, over the network. The problem with that is that the closure will actually retain a pointer to the uh, class, uh, to the object of class C. And everything in that object will transitively be retained in the closure. So that includes this some large collection. And probably when you wrote that closure, you never thought that could happen. So these things really are big surprises to developers, and they're bad surprises. So what we would like to do is have closures much, be much more safe and safer for uh, serializing. So 
the right way to do right to, to write the, the closure to do later is the way you see it here. So what we need to do is we just need to have this local computation that says, well, uh, take the sum and put it in the value s, and now the function in the next line would close over s. So it would, re re it would refer to s and no longer the self-pointer of the class c. And that way, the closure would have an environment that consists just of a single uh, number. So it would be very small. The tricky bit is, of course, is programmers can do that today. But for doing it today, you have to sort of know where the traps are. And put in the remedies. And you don't know. Serialization is completely opaque. So you don't see what it does. So the uh, solution to that that we, we have worked on is to have this concept of a spore, where you say you put then the closure in a thing called spore. And in the spore, uh, if you spore typically returns with a closure, like you see here on the last line of the spore. But the spore is a macro that makes sure that this closure will only use values that are local to the spore, nothing outside. So everything that gets captured by the closure must be listed in the value definitions of the spore. And that way, you can be completely safe, because if you have a hidden dependency, the compiler will, co will tell you and will say, no, that's an error. So spores are, in a sense, closures that can sort of travel over the network and be safely sent to other places. OK, that was number two. Number three is fusion. So uh, in the earlier Spark summits this year, Kai Osterhut had a talk that a lot of Spark jobs are compute bound. Uh, there was a talk, Making Sense of Spark Performance. And of course, lazy collections avoid the intermediate results. Uh, but uh, there's still an overhead, because even if your collections is lazy, uh, you have each operation is a separate closure. And you can't look inside the closure. That's a, it's, a, it's an opaque object uh, for, for the library. So all you can do is just call this and call that. You can't really fuse these closures together. Uh, Spark has now solved this problem in, uh, with data frames. So data frames are essentially a way, uh, a domain-specific language, to look inside closures, to look, look inside everything. But the, the uh, restriction of data frames is essentially it only supports the operations that are supported by data frames. You can't use all the operations in your underlying language for that. So Fusion essentially attacks the same problem. So Fusion cuts through this. It can combine several closures in a tight loop. Spark implements Fusion for data frames, but we would like the same for general Scala code. So what we've worked on here is a project called the Dotty Linker. Uh, it's a smart whole program optimizer. Uh, it analyzes and tunes the program and the dependencies, removes that code, eliminates virtual dispatch, eliminates boxing, eliminates closures. It can do all that because essentially it sees the whole program, and uh, that gives it much more knowledge about uh, essentially what goes on in the program. So just one example uh, to, to show what it can do is uh, that's a page rank algorithm, ADK nodes. And you see that uh, first the bytecode went down from 60 kilobytes of the app and 5.5 megabytes of the library to just 920 kilobytes. So it shrank a lot. Objects allocated is one sixth. Uh, virtual call is one uh, eighth. Uh, CPU branch miss rate is one fourth. And running time is about one half. For a general purpose optimizer, this is actually pretty good. Because while you can do a lot when you stay on, on very domain-specific operations, for general purpose optimizing, that's, that's currently probably very, very good in particular because it is combined with the JIT. And the JIT, of course, uh, the, the JVM JIT also does a lot of optimizations. So this you get on top of the optimizations of the JVM JIT. Good. So um, just to conclude, I think Spark and Scala are beautiful examples of what can be achieved by a bunch of dedicated grad students using a language and system originally written by another bunch of dedicated grad students. And I'm looking forward to the next steps of the co-evolution. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Is there questions? We still have some time. Sure. Uh, we can do a small Q&A session if people have a couple of questions. Let me grab the microphone.
Hi. Uh, Can you stand up? Oh, sure. Hi. I want to know if you have any plans to add, uh, like, uh, C like C or C++ like packing for uh, Scala class objects and also the multidimensional arrays, which will help for uh, different hardware platforms. It will be a great help. Right. So they, um, we, directly we are, we are hampered a little bit by running on the JVM. So essentially we can do that better if we don't run on the JVM. And there are essentially two ways to get that. One is essentially this series of the OptiX languages that we did with uh, Kundrio Lokotun's group in Stanford, uh, which is research, uh, where, which uses a staging, essentially something very sim similar to data frames, but now for the full language, and then a number of backends. So the backends could be C, a cluster, typically a supercomputer backends, or GPU backends, or things like that. So then you can, of course, do that, but that's sort of a special kind of compilation where you say you compile it and then you stage it. That means at runtime or at load time, there will be another compiler that does then the mapping. Uh, the other thing is we currently have a project to uh, go to have a backend that's LLVM based. And I would be very interested to get feedback on that. So essentially, what would be possible use cases? Who would be interested in that? And so on. So that's also very, very early stage right now. So I guess the answer, what you can use next year, no, probably not. But for, for later, it could be. Hold on, let me, uh, let me give you the microphone back. OK. I was also interested in asking about uh, approach Spark uh, Unsafe, uh, which is the uh, Project Tungsten, which is what Project Tungsten uses. I, I didn't. The Project Tungsten in Spark, they tungsten, use uh, yeah. Sun, Misc, Unsafe uh, yes, explicit. Yes. So I was also asking about that, whether that can be used for uh, packing. Yeah, objects. absolutely. I think that would be a big thing we, sh we should have a look at how we can maybe use that, uh, because I think off-heap is, of course, a very, very common use case now. More and more people need it. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll cut, cut off questions there. I'm sure there's no shortage of questions. Uh, we'll just move along to stay on time. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank Martin. you. Thank you. <laughs>